All right. Hey, guys. Um, good to see you again. So the race car, don't really have any updates. But what I wanted to do for today was, uh, you know, I've done a lot of research, talked to a lot of people about, um, you know, micros and trying to understand how they work. I found, um, personally, there's not a whole lot of information about a lot of these things, uh, just widely accessible on the internet or on YouTube. Um, and so I, I want to kind of change that and make it easier. There's a lot of smart people uh, probably watching these videos. Um, and, you know, I, I think that it just helps having this information out there uh, accessible in a, in a media as, you know, easy for everyone to use as YouTube or something. So today um, I'm going to be going through kind of the different designs for micro sprint rear suspension because it's something that I didn't really understand until I started getting involved. Um, so my background is in mechanical engineering, like I've said before on the channel. Uh, when I was in college, I did um, Formula SAE. And part of my, um, one of my roles on that was, was doing um, suspension research and development. Um, I did some work in, um, you know, kinematics and stuff like that. So camber, um, camber curves, stuff like that. Um, so this is something I kind of understand, have experience with. Um, and so, yeah, let's just get into, into um, the rear suspension on these things. So what are our goals? Um, so the rear axle uh, is a separate piece from the chassis and we want to, we want to fix this thing to the, to the chassis, uh, and we want it to be able to move up and down. So that's bump and rebound here. Um, so it can move vertically and we want it to be able to roll left and right. Um, so if you're thinking of the axle, maybe it's easier to think of the axle being like fixed in place and imagining the chassis of the car rolling left to right, you know, when you're in a corner or something, every other way that this chassis could move relative to the axle or vice versa, uh, we want to get rid of. So the axle should not be able to move forward or backward uh, in the axle, or sorry, in the chassis. Um, you know, it shouldn't be able to twist this way, stuff like that. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, we, we want to be able to provide uh, a way for uh, giving the axle spring and damping. Um, so, you know, well, there's a way to package all of that stuff so that um, you get consistent results and consistent installation ratios and things like that, if you're familiar with that. Uh, and you know, this, this car is a little bit unique, um, in that it's, it's chain driven. And so another thing is we want to be able to keep consistent chain tension on, um, the sprockets so that you're not, um, you know, damaging the chain or skipping teeth or the chain doesn't fall off, stuff like that. So, uh, longitudinally forward and backward in the car, how do we constrain the axle relative to the chassis? Well, the first design, uh, that's used pretty commonly is a wishbone design. Um, now personally, I look at this more of like a trailing arm or a truck arm, because to me, a wishbone is, you know, it's what you would call an A arm an independent rear suspension or something. Um, but the, you know, and, and it moves laterally with respect to the chassis, but, uh, in the, the dirt racing vernacular, it, everyone seems to call it a wishbone. So it's this piece right here, and the there's one pickup here that acts as sort of the instant center for its rotation. So it's able to move instantaneously about that point. Um, it pivots there, and then the other two points here locate uh, on the bird cages. So why do you need two pickup points? Well, if you don't, then the bird cage is able to move forward and backwards. Um, maybe that's the way if you, if you're Miller, uh, with sprint cars or micro sprints, you're thinking of timing the birdcage, the way that birdcage moves in that, in that respect. So you have to constrain that motion, um, so that when you're on the track, that doesn't happen. So that's why there's two bolts. You have a wishbone on each side of the car and yeah, so that's what is keeping this axle from moving forward and backward. Now the wishbone is not ideal, um, because you have that instant center on the chassis, right? Now, ideally you would like that to be really far away um, so that the, the chassis, or sorry, the, the axle is able to move straight up and down. Um, but with this design, you're not able to do that. So if you're thinking about it, you know, this, uh, this has some effective length with that, which I'm calling L naught here. Uh, and then it's being multiplied by cosine theta, theta being uh, the pitch angle of the wishbone relative to the chassis. Um, so, you know, at, if you're familiar with the small angle approximation, like if you took uh, pre-calculus or something like that, when the angle is small, it's, it's pretty close to one. So you're, you're just getting this, uh, value of L naught here. Um, but as you deviate more and more, um, the, it gets to do with the way the Taylor series and, uh, expansion works and all that. But, 
uh, the deviations get further and further from L naught. So as you get to more extreme angles up or down, this, this effective wishbone length, the projected length of the wishbone, if you were looking at the car um, from the side perspective, it's getting shorter. Um, so, you know, you can imagine this would be bad. Um, so, you know, if one side is uh, in more bump than the other, that's actually gonna shorten one side more than the other. And um, so that, that causes what we call roll steer. And so when the car's in roll, when one side's going through more bump than the other, uh, the rear axle actually isn't straight in the car. So in sprint car land, um, if you had, you know, you're thinking the big top wing, when you, you know, uh, get the car into the corner sideways and the thing wings over to the left rear, um, you're, you're compressing that left rear into the car. And that's actually generating roll steer to the right. Um, and so I've kind of drawn this diagram here. So you can imagine, you know, in a winged car, you're winging over, you're actually going to have a couple degrees of angle to the right. And that causes um, some issues because now the wheels are not traveling perpendicular to your velocity. So uh, you can imagine that on throttle, you know, the, if the tire is here, it's trying to push forward while the center of mass is here. That creates a, a, a twisting force, a, a moment about the center of mass here. And so when you're on throttle, you're wanting you know, the car's wanting to spin around on you. So oversteer, it's, it's being looser. Um, and then it's actually, it, it's bad because it's inconsistent. When you're actually decelerating with the rear axle, um, it's, it's doing the other thing and it's pulling back. And then, so that's kind of forcing the right front of the car, you know, up towards the wall, uh, creating a lot of understeer, which is bad. Um, so that's not ideal, but that, that's just a characteristic of the suspension design. The second way, and this I think is more common than the wishbone design. By the way, my Sawyer, my 2014 Sawyer is a wishbone car. Uh, you've probably seen that in the videos. Um, uh, from what I've seen, I think they're still wishbone cars. Sawyer still builds wishbone cars. Um, and, and I know Hyper as well uh, runs wishbone cars. So as far as, um, you know, continuing forward, this is a, a, what we call a Z-Link. So you see the axle is actually being held in place by um, this upper radius rod here, and then it connects to the top side of the birdcage, and then the bottom side of the birdcage is actually being located by this torsion arm. Uh, so I'll go into detail later about what the torsion arm is actually doing, uh, but one of its jobs here is actually to constrain the axle so that it can't you know, move forward and backward longitudinally in the car. Now. There's a very good video here, uh, which I've, I've cited. Uh, it's by Pedantic Publishing. Uh, and you could find it if you uh, went to YouTube. I, I gave the actual link, but if you were to look up Watts Link, W-A-T-T-S Link, L-I-N-K, um, on YouTube, this video does a great job of explaining how it works. This is very similar in concept. So you see it's, it's physically like a Z. Um, and the idea is that just it's kind of complicated in the, in the way the kinematics work, but the axle will actually go straight up and down because of the way this geometry is designed. Uh, it just has to do with the way these arc links are and where the instant centers are. Um, so the axle, you know, think of this, you're looking at it laterally here, but the Z link design is actually constraining the car longitudinally or the axle longitudinally. So it does the same thing. The axle is going to move up and down perfectly straight. Uh, in the car. So that fixes what we were talking about earlier, right? Uh, roll steer and, and all that. Well, it does, yes, but you run into a big issue. What I didn't mention earlier is the wishbone, you know, uh, the left side pickup is actually right next to where the front sprocket is on the car. And so your chain tension, um, you know, you're thinking about the distance from the front sprocket to the rear sprocket because of the way the wishbone works. It's always the same. And so, um, you don't have to worry about once you set chain uh, tension like in the pits or something you don't have to worry about it anymore because that distance between the front and rear sprockets is always going to be pretty much the same uh with a z-link that's not true because since the axle is traveling perfectly up and down yeah you fix the problem of roll steer but now whenever the axle goes through a lot of bump or a lot of rebound you you know you're extending the distance between the front and rear sprockets um, which is a problem because the chain's only so long. You're going you're gonna to break chains and, and cause a lot of issues there. So on Z-Link cars, pretty much you'll exclusively see them run these, uh, 
these uh, chain tensioners. These, uh, this is the design I see most common. There's a couple other ways to do this, but this seems to be the most common where you have um, an actual attachment on the Nerf bar, which is not ideal because if you were to damage the Nerf bar or something, um, you know, ideally the Nerf bar doesn't come out and it's so close to where it picks up on the chassis anyway. Hopefully it wouldn't be an issue, but it is mounted to the Nerf bar um, just with a hose clamp and then the spring is keeping tension in the chain. So you can actually have a little bit of slack in the chain. And then this, uh, this tensioner takes that out. And when the axle moves, uh, the chain's trying to get longer and it fights against this, um, this tensioner here. So that you're always able to have the right amount of chain. You don't have to worry about, um, chain length and all that once you've set it up really. Um, but anyway, so this adds weight. It's not ideal. Um, and, and you have more moving parts here. Um, you have to, you know, perform maintenance on, I don't really know. Cause I've never, I don't own a, uh, a Z link car. So I don't have to worry about this. Um, this is why my car doesn't have a chain tensioner on it. And this is also why on my car, uh, it's not as important for the axle. You know, once that you locate the axle, um, by squaring it and everything, you, you know, it's not that important where the chain is and all that. You don't have to worry about checking chain tension all the time and stuff. You still will, of course, but um, anyway, kind of rambling now. Okay, so that's longitudinal constraints on the on the axle. Let's talk about lateral constraints. So lateral being um, keeping the axle from moving left to right in the car. So my car, um, my Sawyer, and what I see a lot of cars do is they have a pan hard bar. I came, I grew up watching NASCAR, so I kind of call it a track bar. It does the same thing. Um, well, it, it's not just doing the same thing. It is the same thing. So it is a physical bar that is, you can see it's attached here on the birdcage. And then the other end of it is attached to a point on the chassis. Uh, and it's, you know, a physical rigid bar that's keeping the axle from moving left or right. So this kind of gets into some more complex things. Where those two pickup points are uh, on both the birdcage and the chassis, matter their heights matter a lot because um if you're thinking of the axle as being a fixed item um the the entire chassis roll is going to pivot based on that pan hard bar you know it's going to be able to, it can only pivot about that pan hard bar at the rear of the car so that uh is what we call a roll center so on a pan hard car the roll center i don't i'm you know as far as kinematics go i'm not super well versed in this but the roll center in a pan hard car is going to be in the center of the track bar, the pan hard bar. Um, and if you're not familiar with roll centers, I would recommend looking up uh, Engineering Explains video on roll centers, or there's some other good content that kind of explains what this is. But basically, the higher the um, roll center, or it's not really just about height, it's about how close the roll center is to the center of gravity, center of mass uh, on that end of the car. When these things are closer, that increases or decreases the car's roll stiffness. So generally, as you go up on the roll center height, you're increasing the roll stiffness of the car. That makes the car tend to load the right rear more, um, which is which is why if you increase the roll center height on uh, a pan hard car, um, you're going to loosen the car up. You're increasing the rear roll stiffness. If you think in NASCAR, uh, when, you're, when you're making track bar changes, what you're actually doing is making a roll center height change. Um, so that's what this is. The other thing about a track bar is uh, you have some kinematic changes uh, where the axle is laterally. So if you're thinking the chassis is in one point, this pan hard bar, it, it, this point isn't moving perfectly. You know, it's not staying still left or right uh, with respect to the chassis. So as you go through bump, the axle is moving up. And that, that point is actually moving to the left. So what's that, what that's doing is that's moving the right rear tire in and getting it closer to the center of mass. And because of weight distribution and things like that, you're loading the right rear tire. You're putting bite into the right rear, or I would call it taking cross weight out of the car or taking wedge out of the car because I came from NASCAR lane. Uh, so you're decreasing cross weight percentage. And the same thing in, in droop or rebound, you're moving the left rear in. Um, this is all assuming you're running... Um, a positive track bar split, which means that the track bar is higher on the right side than left side. It's the reverse uh, if your left side is higher than your right side. But generally on micros and stuff, it's it's so that you have a positive track bar split. The right rear is higher than the left rear. Anyway, the other way to do this is with a Jacob's ladder uh, or a Watts link. This is what you'd see on a full-size sprint car as well. So 
uh, it's this piece right here. I call it a W link because it's literally shaped like a W. And it hooks up to these two points. These two straps hook up to the chassis here and here. And then this other end hooks up to the right rear bird cage. Um, so if you're thinking about this, what is constraining the axle from moving left or right? Well, when it's trying to move, this link is holding this triangular section still, and it can't move. Um, so that's what's doing that. And that it's able to, it doesn't uh, over constrain it and bump and rebound because as the axle moves up and down, these, this, this point right here acts as the instant center. And so it's able to still move up um, and then, you know, similarly here, it's able to spin about that point. So, uh, the roll center is not as simple as a track bar, uh, when you have a Jacob's ladder. So if you're looking, you know, you're thinking about the axle being stationary, what is the chassis pivoting about? Uh, it's actually this point way out here. So this imaginary point out in space is where the chassis is going to be moving. These kind of links you're imagining this point right here being still. Uh, so this imaginary line in line, like collinear with this strap and collinear with this strap comes out to a point here. And the same things apply as you increase roll center height, increasing chassis roll stiffness, and that, uh, will increase weight transfer on the right rear. Uh, so as you go up on roll center height, the, you know, you're, you're sensitizing, that's not a word you're increasing load sensitivity to the right rear, which makes the car looser. Uh, when it gets loaded up. Now, if you're looking, um, if I go actually go back to this last page, you can see that this Jacob's ladder has different holes. What that's doing here is you're changing the angle, kind of the static angle of uh, all these joints and stuff. And so that's changing where the, the static roll center is of the car. Like when you block the car, where's the roll center? Um, so that's how that would be similar to how you'd make like a track bar height change uh, on a pan hard car this does the same thing, you know, kinematically, it's just changing where the static roll center of the car is. Okay. So that's constraining the, the axle forward and back and left and right. Now I have to talk about how you're controlling the axle. So pretty much everyone, pretty much everyone uses, uh, this design where you have torsion arms and shocks. So, uh, if you're not familiar with a torsion arm, there is a metal bar that goes into these uh, tubes in the chassis. And that bar is physically, you know, you're thinking torsion, like twisting force. Um, you have a stop here that holds the bar on one end. It's splined and you have a, it's literally called a bar stop. And that sets preload in the bar. Uh, and then on the other end, you have this torsion arm, which connects to the birdcage. Now here I have this uh, hyper that I've pulled up. This hyper is beautiful, by the way. But this is a wishbone car. The torsion arm is not actually constraining the axle left and right. It's just connected via a shackle here um, that you can see. And when the axle uh, goes through bump, it's just, it's loading the torsion arm the same way. Uh, and, and, you know, subsequently uh, putting torsion in the torsion bar. Now, as far as uh, the shock goes, which is how you have a uh, velocity sense of control, uh, generally you'll just load that onto the torsion arm. Now, with a lot of different cars, uh, I've seen a couple different points you can mount the shock to. What that's doing is it's changing the installation ratio, if you're familiar with that. So installation ratio, motion ratio, same kind of thing. Um, you're, you're changing the force that the shock is actually feeling. So the shock is going to be moving at a different speed, a different, um, it's going to feel different things physically, depending on uh, where, you, where you mount it, if there's two or three different holes here. Uh, so you can kind of change shocks that way too. Like you're actually making a valving change without physically changing the valving on the shock. So that's how you do that. Um, that's pretty much what everyone does. Now it's not the only way to do it. Uh, I've, I found this picture. So there's two things here, which I've never seen in the pits, uh, but aren't against the rules as far as chassis design. So one, you can see this design right here is a rear coilover car. Uh, so my car has coilovers on the front, but this design is actually four coilovers. So a coilover all the way around and it just mounts to the birdcage a similar way. There's nothing against this, but, uh, in this sense, there's no torsion arm. Uh, the, the spring, the spring rate for that corner of the car is provided by this coil spring. Um, the other thing is a four link rear end. Uh, so you're still going to have a, a track bar. Or you're going to need something to constrain the axle left or right, but here, you're actually you're using four links. So instead of having two wishbones, you have four links. It gives you a little bit more freedom as far as what you can do in uh, changing 
um, if you're familiar with anti-squat or anti-dive, uh, things like that. What, you, what you're doing there is like we talked about roll center. You're actually changing the kinematic pitch center of the car if you do that. Um, so it's kind of where uh, we're going there, but you, you run into the same issues with roll steer or what they're calling axle steer here. So those are kind of the different designs uh, you can run. Um, there's no real like rules in the rule book regulating these things, thankfully, in my eyes, uh, because that means chassis manufacturers are able to find things that um, work best for them and different cars drive differently. You know, you have a D1 and um, what else? A 10J, a Sawyer, etc. There's so many different manufacturers, uh, a Stallard, like an EMI Stallard or something. They all drive differently because all of these measurements, their wishbone lengths, uh, the actual geometry itself, um, like the triple X here. Um, some of these cars are like hybrid cars. So you can actually run either a, a Z link or a wishbone on some of these cars. They're, they're called like fusion chassis. So there's a bunch of different things uh, you can do, but that's kind of the general, um, sorry, <laughs> that's kind of the general uh, concepts here. Um, hopefully, you're able to learn something watching this. Uh, this is all stuff I've kind of learned um, just from doing research and trying to learn. So hopefully I was able to convey some of that to you. Hopefully it's not been raining as much and you've been able to actually get to a racetrack somewhere and watch. Um, but yeah, that's going to do it for this video. So thank you. Peace.